Welcome to Four Eyes, the podcast series brought to you by Young OD Connect. We give you a clear view into the new grad optometry world across Canada and the U.S. We are your hosts. I'm Dr. Deepan Carr. And I'm Dr. Amrit Bilku. And so you may have just noticed, based off of Deepan's introduction, that we have an exciting announcement to share. Drum roll, please. <laughs> Can we get the can we get the club siren? I know. I wish I could actually do that sound. Get that club siren. I don't know. I don't know what that is. Um, we should make this. Um, we should do a little club dance because okay. we have partnered with Young OD Connect by BMC. Woo! Yay! <laughs> um, and so some of you may know about BMC, um, because they are also responsible for modern optometry and iTube and a lot more, but, um, I think that's what we were mainly familiar with and yeah, we're just really excited to share this news with you guys because like you guys know, and we say it a lot, our podcast was truly built from the ground up with, you know, our own time our own money, um, our own resources. And we really learned step-by-step step how to handle this whole podcast. And honestly, mm -hmm. like we could not have gotten to the place where we are today without the listeners, without you guys listening, sharing, supporting us, telling us what sucked, what was great, um, all that stuff. We could not have gotten to this place without you guys. So thanks. Yeah. And actually, do you remember the exact, date we started our podcast I do actually it was March I 4th do. it was March 4th 2020 yeah three years ago and we started originally started this podcast with our other co-hosts Dr. Alex Kuhn and Dr. Ravinder Randhawa for our podcast it was really important for us to have four females hosting the podcast starting from there and we were completely new grads and I think when we started this we were like why aren't there new grad ODs talking about the problems they're going through clinic or how to get through clinic, what to mm -hmm. do, all these questions we had. And that's what kind of brought this about. And we were all friends when we, like, we're still all friends, but <laughs> we, like, we are still, still all, all friends. friends. <laughs> Dr. Alex Kuhn and Dr. Ravinder Randhawa are still heavily a part of our lives. Oh, of course. Uh, yeah. Um, but I think that's what really brought the chemistry out in our podcast too. We were just all very close friends in optometry school. We uh, know each other very well and we didn't think it was going to get this far, but it blew up for us and everyone really liked it. We got really great feedback. We realized how close knit the optometry mm -hmm. world is oh, across yeah. Canada and the U S and we just kept on going. And yeah, like Amrit said, we got so much support from you guys which motivated us to keep on going, which is great. Yeah. We get people asking to be interviewed on our podcast now, which is insane to think about because Deep One was definitely the main communications lady behind the scenes. So, I mean, the people, <laughs> this girl had to email to yeah, just- I was harassing people <laughs> like, come on our podcast. Like, who is this? I'm like, just just come on our podcast. <laughs> You'll find out later. Trust come us. On our Trust us. It's about optometry. Don't worry. And then they see the happy hour drink episodes and they're like, what the hell are you guys doing? You guys all, of course, already know about us and we should stop blabbing about us. We should yeah. talk about Young OD Connect. Yes. Um, there is a reason why we chose to partner with them and have our podcast on their platform and collaborate with, you know, this organization and this group. Um, because as you know, as you know, the Four Eyes podcast is all about young ODs connecting us together across Canada and the U.S. Um, and also like optometry students, because of course they're going to be new grad ODs soon. Um, and Young OD Connect is a membership-based community and educational platform that provides mentorship, workshops, and other resources specifically for new grad ODs and soon-to-be ODs, so students. And they really do support, you know, the growth of optometry as a profession and our growth as individual practitioners. They promote, you know, full scope and advancements in optometry. 
they promote practice management or private practice. Like they, they're just here to support young ODs. Um, yeah. and they do have some Canadian ODs on their board too. So we definitely fell in love with their platform. And when we got the opportunity to share our podcast with them, I mean, our values are just so similar. So, um, it just worked yeah. out and yeah. we're really I mean, excited for that. Yeah. And everything you just said right there is basically why we started this podcast, right? Yeah. Because we were going through those tribulations at that time. And we were like, well, where's the support to like figure mm -hmm. out the answers to these questions and young OD was already doing that. So, yeah. and that's what our goal, our main goal was to do for other ODs, new ODs, new grads. So yes, our values are pretty much, we'll throw it out there now. We're getting paid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even if Obviously, your side hustles, you guys, yeah. <laughs> it'll eventually happen if you're passionate enough about it. Yes. Yeah. And obviously that's not the main reason why we joined Young OD Connect, but yeah, it, it like, honestly, for the listeners, you guys know our journey. We always mm -hmm. say that too. We're doing this for free. We don't even get paid for stuff. We worked so hard to try and attain sponsorships um, and, and paid opportunities and which is going to connect into the episode today. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it took us three years for this podcast to really grow show what we're worth, show what amazing stuff we have to offer and show what amazing listenership we have across yeah. the continent and across the world. And so we're finally getting compensated for yeah. yeah, a side hustle that we started. And that information, you know, really applies to the episode that we have today for you guys. Today, we are going to have Dr. Emily Seitz join us on the podcast for an interview uh, because we're going to talk about negotiation and not just negotiating for job opportunities, but also, you know, other side hustles or social media collaborations and contracts. You know, there's definitely a need for more open conversations about negotiating and, you know, red flags or how to ask for more compensation without, you know, really asking. And, you know, we felt that Emily would be the best person to share her experience and tips on the podcast because she shares a lot of that on her social media. And Dr. Seitz is also a board member for Young OD Connect. So that just works out perfectly. <laughs> Yeah, no, this episode is great because Emily's kind of like the hype girl for the negotiating yes. of the contract, right? She is not afraid to talk about money. Um, this episode has really good, great tips about that. So we're so excited for everyone to listen to it. Yeah. And so without further ado, we will get started with the interview. We hope you guys enjoy the episode and learn a lot from Dr. Seitz. So Emily, for those who don't know who you are, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yes. Yeah, so my name is Dr. Emily Seitz. I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio. I went to Ohio State for undergrad and then the Pennsylvania College of Optometry in Philadelphia for optometry school. After that, I went on to do residency at the um, Salisbury VA in North Carolina and then took my North Carolina board exam and I've been practicing here ever since. Um, after I finished residency, I kind of went out into the workforce and I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, where, what kind of model I wanted to work with or in, you know, I had residency training in ocular disease. So I kind of figured I would fit into a pri private practice model, maybe ODMD, um, interviewed at, at those locations, interviewed at private equity, even to kind of get an idea of just what, what's out there, um, what opportunities are out there and try and figure out what fits the best for me. And right after residency for about 10 months, I, what the right fit ended up being working for two independent private practices, um, as a 1099 contractor, and then also corporate as well. So mm -hmm. four days a week, I was in two different private practices, completely unaffiliated. They were just sharing me. And then every other week I would rotate through corporate optometry in a Walmart sublease. Um, and that was an amazing experience. I felt like I gained so much from it, but leading up to that process, it was a huge risk of, okay, I'm not just signing a normal W2. Like I expected I would, I'm, I'm kind of heading into a venture um, that's unknown. And, and there were a lot of unknowns in getting to that process, which we'll kind of yeah, dive into my thoughts of, of when I did that. Um, after I did 10 and contracting for the last, I think now it's been about another, almost another 10 months now, 
I've been working in a group private practice in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, there are nine ODs, four partners, wow. and three locations. And I go between two locations. Um, and I ended up implementing a dry eye clinic in one of in the that setting. So, you know, talking about a specialty and integrating a specialty into a contract and where does that fit in terms of negotiation also was a learning experience and maybe mm -hmm. something I didn't do quite perfectly, which I'm willing to share openly. Um, but it, it was, it was an interesting part of, of my story and how I, how I came to end up in my career right now. Yeah. And I've, I know I've personally seen that journey of you starting to implement dry eye into your group practice, um, through your Instagram stories and, you know, the things that you share on social media, which was amazing. I know we had an episode way back when I think deep one, was it with Dr. Diana Nguyen? We talked about like, just as a new graduate doctor coming in, trying to implement a new, um, yeah. like specialty yeah, yeah. within a practice, but you know, this is, definitely something we can dive into on how to negotiate that. Um, right. cause we kind of just scratched the surface on that, but now you're talking about, you know, what are those actions that, you know, what are the things that you can bring to the table to convince that owner or those partners, um, you know, that you can bring something into the practice. Um, but let's start because I know our listeners are probably like itching to <laughs> get into it. So, you know, for optometry students and definitely new graduate uh, graduated doctors, the first fear is finding a job and finding the job opportunities. The contract presented to you, though, can really become the second fear when it doesn't fully fit your needs. And now you have to try to negotiate for something different. So how do you recommend we prepare for that negotiation process with the right mindset when many of us probably feel uncomfortable and fearful asking employers for something different than what's presented. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I think my, my first tip is one, there's plenty of resources out there and I highly encourage you to utilize them. Um, Chris Lopez is excellent at contract negotiations and I did have him actually review my contract before I started. I didn't have him review my independent contracts. Those were really simple and pretty straightforward. And there was some risk on each side for each party. Um, you know, the chance that I could kind of leave whenever the chance that I could come in when, whenever. Um, but I, I think that he's a great resource, um, for contract negotiation. So I usually always start with him. Kate Ham is also an expert in this area. So she could quote you all the data of like, here's the percentage that maybe will just give you confidence. Like, Hey, I should be negotiating. And I think mm -hmm. that that's the first step is really convince yourself that you should be negotiating. Look at the statistics, especially for female practitioners of where we fall in terms of compensation related to our male colleagues and let that serve a little bit as motiv as motivation to just doing contract mm -hmm. negotiation and fighting for what you're worth. Um, the second thing, I always, I always feel like you never know what you don't know. So a big part for me of contract negotiation, I felt like so nervous not knowing where I should stand because I don't know what other people are asking for. Yeah. And I think the best way to, to end up getting that answer is to one, just practice. Go, and I've heard other people give this advice too, and it may be to the uh, dismay or disdain of practice owners, but I am so sorry. I am going to just straight out say it. Young practitioners, even interview at places where you don't think you really want to work. It, mm -hmm. It's good practice. And you at least need to know a ballpark of what offers are on the table. Um, I think a fair starting salary, and this is going to be regional dependent. It's going to be kind of state dependent as yeah. well. Um, at least in North Carolina, non-residency trained, I, I think it's appropriate to ask for $120,000. I think that that's fair. Um, and kind of like think about that as a baseline in your mind. Residency trained, maybe go up 5K, maybe go up 10K, maybe see if those other opportunities are caked in to use your residency experience. Mm -hmm. There are some residencies that I think may deliver a little bit more value to the practice owner. And so kind of think about it in terms of the practice owner, what you have to give to them. Um, the other thing is don't give a number. I mean, if you're just not sure what's <laughs> out there, don't say anything. Say something like, I'm looking for fair market value. I'm looking for, you know, what you, I, I would be curious to see what you feel like is an appropriate for someone with my training and expertise. 
Um, that was probably the biggest mistake that I made is I kind of threw out a number and they're just like, okay. And then you realize, darn, I should ask for more. Um, Mm -hmm. You are not a business owner. It is not your responsibility or job to know what figures they should be offering you. They're the business owner. They should be the ones that know what they should be compensating an associate. So don't let the pressure come back on you and don't get too, too nervous. Um, Really ask the owner to kind of step up and share those numbers with you. Yeah, I think when it comes to compensation, anytime when you're negotiating a contract, that is like the fear. So even thinking like, Ooh, what am I going to ask for? Should I even ask or should I wait for them to tell me this whole thinking process for me? When I first started, I was like, oh my gosh, just nervous about yeah. that particular number for like every interview. And again, bringing up a number was, I was just, that was off the table for me. And I like what you said, like, it's not the OD's job to figure out what the exact compensation should be. That's the yeah. owner's job to give yeah. you that amount that you deserve really and think Um, about it too when you're going through an interview like the entire time you're trying to impress the owner right you're trying to like share yourself like give them this information and then how much of a plot twist is it when they come back and say so what are you looking for for compensation right Mm -hmm. you're still in that mindset of wait I'm trying to impress you and so the nerves only pile on if you already don't have a figure mentioned um, you know, if you have a, a figure that, let's say you go and interview in corporate, right? And you, they throw out this 180,000, 160,000, those offers are out there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so say you come to a private practice, you may know that that's not going to be something that they can offer, but you still can share that. And you still can say, these are some of the offers that I've been entertaining. Um, you know, sometimes they'll say, well, I know it's a corporate figure, like we can never match that. And I'm like, that's perfectly fine. Let me know what you think is appropriate for this position. Yeah. Yeah. And let's be realistic too. So we've been talking just about salary, but there are other things that are going to be important. Um, You know, it's really easy when it's your first job and you're first coming out of school to think, well, I've just been working for one thing. Like, I don't know what free time is. I don't enjoy that. Right. Um, But the way that I actually, it was explained to me to think about negotiation, negotiating, and I've kind of carried it through is maybe you start with salary. Maybe you don't, maybe something else is more important to you and you're happy with the base salary, but the rest of the package, the way it looks between paid vacation days um, or CE, maybe there's Mm -hmm. something else that's missing. And so I would encourage everyone to actually sit down and think about what is the most important thing to me when I'm working. Do I really want a day for myself to be able to go to my doctor's appointments, do some self-care, do some social media? Like, is that important to not actually have a high salary, but to actually Mm -hmm. have maybe one day a month built into my schedule to have extra PTO or something like that? So think about the components that are actually really, really important to you. And then think about negotiating as like this negotiating tier. So maybe salary, salary to me was, you know, highest. I I think for most people it is. Um, But if they're not willing to budge on salary, then go down to the next step. Are you thinking about being in this area for forever? Non-compete. That was something else in my contract that I really wanted to negotiate just because I didn't know where I was going to end up. I didn't want to get pushed out. Um, And I don't necessarily have a family, but if you have a family and you have a kid in a school district, maybe that does end up becoming higher on the list, maybe even higher than salary. You know, if you think that this is just a a job that you're going to be in for a short period of time, but you don't want to get pushed out 15 miles, right? Then maybe that does take a higher priority and you negotiate a little bit harder on that. Mm -hmm. Um, But I certainly know what it feels like to hear no. And it's really, really frustrating, especially in group settings when they say, well, we've never done it that way. This is the way it's set for all doctors. We mm-hmm. can't really change it or it'd be unfair. Mm-hmm. I think that those things are, are really disheartening for young ODs to hear because if you want an employee bad enough, you will end you up will changing change. it. You can mm-hmm. end up changing mm-hmm. it. But I think you were gonna, we were gonna talk about a little bit more about like some red flags and things that mm-hmm. you might have mm-hmm. felt. Deepa, yeah. what kind of things did you, have you ever been in like an interview process where you're like, ooh, I don't, I don't, I'm not getting good vibes from this situation? Yeah, so for me, it's completely the vibe situation. I, energy, whatever that energy mm-hmm. I'm getting off of the employer, for sure, um, for sure that. And then actually, yeah, like I, that part where you were talking about 
um, the compensation and how much power ODs actually have. I don't think a lot of young ODs realize that, like how much they're worth. And if someone is like, I remember when I first started, someone also told me like, oh, I can pay you like 25 to $30 an hour. And I already knew then like, okay, this is the wrong vibe check. Obviously you're not, you don't think uh, like these new graduates are even worthy enough to like work at your clinic and you don't want to pay us properly. Like that's already a red flag there for me. Yeah. Um, but definitely personality of the employer. I always, 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 yeah. always want to To add to that, um, I actually had someone recently ask me um, about the job market in Ontario where I practice and I actually um, recommended some tips that I wish I did when I was looking for job opportunities. I really recommended them to interview with the practice, but then before, you know, even looking at the contract or signing the contract, shadow the OD that works there for the day. So get the vibe of the staff, the patients, the flow, the office equipment, you know, the smell, I don't know, like whatever, (laughs) just get a vibe of that place. And then if you're able to find out what ODs used to work there before contact those ODs privately and ask, you know, how, how did you find the, you know, work environment, um, the relationships between the employer, the staff, because I wish that I knew that because I think for me, just through the interview process, I did not pick up on those subtle signs Mm -hmm. of, you know, really high staff turnover, like having a new receptionist every month um, Mm -hmm. that were all students in undergraduate studies um, and just, you know, the patients that came in. So shadowing is definitely something that I would recommend. And I was going to add something actually, Emily, to your points about um, what else we could negotiate rather than just compensation, especially for those who want to bring on maybe a specialty um, a specialty practice to that location, or if you're joining an office that has a specialty service, you can always try to negotiate for the practice to pay for your CE for those courses or to pay for your registration for like Academy or some of the conferences. Um, and then you can also ask your employers if they can pay for your association fee for your state or province if they can pay for your licensing renewal fees. To yeah, know. I think one of the key things like I, I always thought about too is is I always try and think in terms of a practice management, like a practice owner. And I think that gives me a little bit of a leg up on negotiating. Um, you know, one of the things I realize is an ocular disease residency, yes, it makes me a stronger clinician, but unless I'm actually building dry eye clinic, it's not giving them additional revenue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So oftentimes I would go and say, well, I'm a resident trained. Like, why aren't you offering me like at least 10 K more than this other, you know, associate. And for the most part, it's not building more revenue if you're not bringing in more medical exams. And I mean, we could go on and on about medical Mm -hmm. optometry. A lot of practice owners don't see value in medical optometry and how much more money that brings in. Yeah. Um, but I think that's just, you know, recognizing kind of in the state of optometry and where it's at in terms of, you know, not catching up with that. You really have to have something that's actually sellable. Um, mm-hmm. One of the things that ended up being part in, in part of my contract that, I mean, I, I'm still indifferent on it is, you know, to me, it was kind of said, well, yes, we're going to invest in equipment. And that is part of what brought me on to it is, you know, I don't have any overhead with intense pulse light therapy. The practice does, that's not on me. Um, but I also don't get to include that in my, um, bonus structure until that instrument's paid off. So it's a little bit of a give and a take in, in that kind of negotiation. Yes. I actually had full reins to kind of get the clinic up and running to get referrals from the other ODs, which is really, really fun to do. So I'm enjoying when I'm practicing and the company is in turn going to end up profiting. Even if I leave, they'll end up profiting from intensive site mm-hmm. therapy. Um, but it's, it's a little bit of a waiting game, right? I don't get to actually benefit from that monetary income until the instruments paid off. So it's a little bit of like a catch 22 with, with how that ends up working out. 
So Emily, any other red flags that you can think of besides the ones that me and Amrit mentioned for? Well, yeah, I mean, I think the intuition is really, really good. I, I feel like how they're willing, how the owner is at negotiating during the process, I feel like will tell you a little bit about how you can expect the rest to go. Um, I interviewed at, at one practice and it was an ODMD practice and it was just a complete lowball author. I felt so weird about it. I mentioned my social media. I mentioned how involved I am. I mentioned that I do end up earning revenue. And one of their comments was that they would end up taking a portion of my revenue that I would make. So <laughs> that is a red flag. Um, anyone that's trying to impede <laughs> on your own personal success, <laughs> all the stories I could tell, right? Um, <laughs> that is a red flag. Um, you know, anyone that's not being forthright with a contract, I think is a, is a red flag as well. Um, I remember trying to negotiate with someone and I just said, Hey, I'm waiting for the contract. Like, please send it over. It'd been months. Then the next time I asked for it, Oh, my manager was mm -hmm. out sick. And I'm like, this is all starting to feel a little bit weird. I know you have several associates. How is it not kind of this carbon paste copy? I'm just asking mm -hmm. for that first. So anyone that's a little bit just putting you on edge or making you work really, really hard just to get it. I just don't think is, is really the opportunity that you want. I'd actually also say a red flag sometimes can be the opposite where the employer doesn't even ask a lot about you. And, and they're just kind of like, you're an OD sick. All right, here's a contract. I need someone <laughs> like sign up and I, if you can breathe. All right, cool. Like, let's get you in that room. I've taken a job opportunity with that vibe. Then when you start practicing, you're like, oh, okay, maybe I should have not taken that opportunity so quickly, so easily Yeah. because that per that employer, I don't even think that employer knew my full name and, you know, they don't know anything about me. They didn't socialize with me, nothing. And I think that gives off a little bit of a, a bad vibe too. If they're not really interested in knowing what your skills are, what your passion is where you went to school, where did you graduate? Like if they don't have an interest, that's going to linger. Yeah. yeah. And ask a lot of questions. I mean, a lot of questions to everyone. I think you guys were mentioning, like ask the former employees that have been there. Yeah. What has their experience been? I was in one place that like promised, okay, you're going to be medical. We're going to bring you in, in this corporate setting. And we want you to practice medically. This is a location where there's a lot of medical care here. And it just so happened to be during the pandemic. And so I asked, some of the other ODs, I was like, so uh, how many visual fields have you guys like been running? And they're like, we haven't run a visual field in over a year. And I'm just like, <laughs> that can't be a medical practice, right? Like yeah. glaucoma still exists, even if it's a pandemic. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, some things are going to be obvious, but like some things you want to believe the good in people and you want to believe that there's opportunity there. And they can sit and say like, you know, we have X, Y, Z number of patients with whatever, um, but if the story doesn't line up, if there's not staffing there to then carry that through, right. Um, if no one's trained on the equipment that you want to bring in or implement, or, you know, this basic equipment, yeah. then, um, ask if there's going to be staff assigned to you, um, make that part of your contract negotiating saying like, I need a counselor, a treatment counselor. I need someone mm -hmm. that can be like by my side to do lip -a flow while I'm like charting and come back, you know? advocate for the things that you want and the things that you need to the best mm -hmm. of your ability. That's actually a really important point. I feel like I've had, I've been in many situations too, where I've been interviewed and I was promised certain things. And then when you actually talk to the staff, they're like, yeah, this hasn't happened here in like a year. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. So mm -hmm. when am I actually going to, you know, do this kind of appointment or like, you know, so it's just very, you have to be very careful with that. And yes, most people do have good intentions at heart, but it's always good to ask other team members or other staff members what's actually going on in the clinic because they'll actually hopefully tell you the truth. Um, so Emily, you kind of talked about this briefly in one of your stories, um, but so many ODs are now on social media discussing eye care topics and products to educate the public and other healthcare professionals. For those ODs that are interested in monetizing their social media presence, how would they even start? That's such a great question because I feel like I actually have not really said this one point that I wanted to bring up. Um, yeah. 
So this is a Dr. Seitz exclusive. This is, this is um, <laughs> and I actually, I'll give like a lot of advice about how to get started and how to do this, how to do that. But the very first thing I did is I did a lot of stuff for free and mm-hmm. no one wants to really hear that, but that is the truth of it. Did a lot of stuff yeah. for free. Um, <laughs> but this, this episode is free, by the way, yeah, everyone, <laughs> this is free. <laughs> I did, we did a lot for free. Yeah. And you know what? I think that there's so much value in that because when you're just starting out and building, you do need to build your resume. So even though transitions, I didn't get paid anything for it. Guess what? Now I can go to Shamir and say, I worked at Transition Lenses. I was yeah. their student ambassador. So in the very beginning, I think it's really about building kind of that criteria, building that, re- that resume. My CV has like every interview that I've done, every article that I've written, um, whether it was commentated or not, it just shows diversity and experience. And that will yeah. eventually end up paying you one day. So mm-hmm. I would say take on products for free. Um, there are some products where people will DM me and they'll say, hey, you know, we, we want to send you this device. We want you to try it out and, and do social media about it. And I'm at the point now where I can say, is this a paid opportunity? Because really that's all I'm doing right now. The second thing is once you do get that first paid opportunity, blow it out of the water. Really, really just nail it. Put your whole heart into making it something amazing, better than what you are going to get paid for it. You're going to get $50 for like posting and like ask all your friends to please interact with it. Please blow it up, right? Reshare to your story, add other features that they don't ask for. Maybe they ask for a post, make it into a reel, make it into a story. Um, Mm -hmm. Share demographics. I always share demographics from the way that anything's performed because a lot of people that are paying for for that content, they want to know how it's performing. And even just the openness of, hey, I got 300 views on this story. That's great. That's amazing. It's 300 more than they would have done if they didn't reach out to you. Mm -hmm. So it all goes a long way with building with a company. Um, I think after the hardest part, and I get asked about this a lot, is how did I figure out how to charge companies? And, and and we were talking about this just the other day. How did you figure out what to charge companies? Um, you know, I think that there are different like metrics. If you go on, let's say Instagram, because that's mostly where I end up doing paid content is, is Instagram. Others have YouTube, others have LinkedIn and different kind of features, but I stay kind of within Instagram and I've kind of broken it down to, this is what it costs for a post. This is what it costs for a story. This is what it costs for a reel. Um, and you can use how many followers you have, what kind of niche area that you're in to get an idea from, you know, any social media blog about how much you should be charging. If you feel like it's worth more or you've gotten paid in the past by for more then up it a little bit. Um, you know, some people also end up looking at the sponsors that they have and judging based off that. So we were talking about two different methods. One, you know, if it's a smaller, if you know, it's a smaller company, maybe your fees aren't that high. That's one way to kind of start. Um, two, I've also kind of come to a point where, where now I've built it, where I have kind of a set rate and it's just easier. So I don't have to negotiate that much. Yeah. Um, I have instilled my cousin who kind of acts as my media correspondent. And we just like had a legit meeting yesterday doing taxes and <laughs> 1099s. Um, but she's what I call my media correspondent. Every email goes through her. Everything that I need to set up for a meeting goes through her. Negotiations go through her. And if there's any, any other, ever any questions about how much I would want to get paid, she'll ask me. But um, it kind of depends on what the project is, how long it's going to take me, and what my time is valued now. Mm-hmm. I do think once you're done being a student, once you're done being a resident, and you're actually getting paid to work, you view time very differently. Uh, each clinic day I get paid about $500. So for me to take more than a whole clinic day or to take time off from clinic, I at least need to get paid that amount of time in clinic revenue. It doesn't make sense for me anymore to fly to Chicago on a paid trip when I'm going to be losing money. Mm -hmm. So, so those are things that I always think about is, you know, is the compensation at the very least what I would get paid in a clinic day? Um, or is, is that something that I'm going to have to try and negotiate for with them? Yeah, that that last point, absolutely so true. And Deepon and I personally feel that way now because now we practice, we work every day. You know, after two to three years of being out in the real world, we know what our average income is per day. And so if we are going to work on any project, we decided to try to break it down 
per hour of our time, you know, because for example, if we get, you know, about $500 per day and, you know, we're working, you know, six hours to eight hours of a day, how much is that per hour? How many hours are we spending at like recording this podcast, getting the interview questions ready, emailing the interviewees to like coordinate their schedule, then editing the podcast, then posting it on the social media and then reposting all the stories. And, you know, that's a lot of hours. Mm-hmm. And that ends up being a whole day of our, uh, a whole day, you know, a whole six to eight hours. Mm-hmm. So I think for us, that's been a great um, pathway to like, kind of, you know, decide what our compensation should be. But I also love your idea when it comes to those social media collaborations of separating different types of content, because they do take different amounts of time. I don't believe that, you know, doing a live IG story, just sharing an experience about something is, you know, as detailed and time consuming as making a IG reel. Those Reels are, are only, so hard. They those are only so 30 easy. seconds. Yeah. Yeah. So right now I'll be very transparent right now where I'm at with my reels is I charge $500 a reel. Yeah. And it takes I'm a whole probably, day. it takes like a whole day, it's a whole day. maybe it's even true. more than that. Um, And I'm probably going to end up increasing, you know, I've gotten a little bit more selective because I've, I've just branched away from so much social media and just more into ad board, more into like doctor engagement groups and things like that, which is just, I think the natural transition of kind of where I want to be. Um, The platform's always changing too. So that's always something that I'm like, do I actually want to keep up with this? Or am I just kind of going along? Cause it feel, cause it feels like that's a space where I should be. Yeah. I guess I have a random question. I mean, I feel like a lot of new ODs who just started their social media kind of wonder, well, how long do I have to wait before I can even ask for compensation? Yeah. Do I need like a thousand followers? Do I need like a hundred listeners if I start a podcast? And I mean, I, I don't even know. I mean, Emily, what do you think the best answer for that is? When's I the best think- time to kind of be like, oh, should I get paid for this first time yeah. opportunity? <laughs> You know, what? I don't think that there's ever a, a good answer because trust me, trust me when I say this, autometry is so slow <laughs> to social media <laughs> and yes. compensating. I mean, like, but I mean, some people do engage in stuff and they don't get paid for it. So it's yes. just like, I mean, and I've sat there and I've been like, okay, if I'm not going to get paid, I'm going to quit the program. And they're like, okay. And I'm like, bye. I'm <laughs> like, yeah. it's so wild, you know? Um, but you know, there's plenty, they're just so slow to it. So there's no hard and fast rules. Mm -hmm. I think it is great to come in with all this confidence and all of this, like, you know, professionalism. And I do believe a little bit in faking it before you make it. I mean, a lot of my whole early cringe worthy stories for me, like kind of like feeling more in tune and more knowledgeable than I really am. Mm-hmm. And there, don't, don't worry. There are plenty of times I got knocked down a peg or two by my own classmates, by upperclassmen. <laughs> I, you know, was really, really put in my place quite a few times, but nevertheless, I still persisted. And I do think you have to have a little bit of that energy and a little bit of the confidence that, yeah, I know I'm doing something good and I'm doing something right here. Yeah. Um, people are watching and people are listening. And so I don't think that the number actually matters especially because we have such a niche audience. I mean, you know, if you're talking to doctors to doctors, my goodness, I mean, companies pay whole dinners, whole dinners at steakhouses for that exact same message. So for them to, and and flights for that doctor to come out, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's like for you to ask for $150 to talk on a story about um, a a product, I mean, as long as it's in their budget, I think that just go for it and ask for it after that conversation if you feel like it's worth it. Maybe you don't start with that. Maybe you ask like, hey, um, I would love to reach out. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, would you be willing to compensate $50 for this project? There's a little bit of things I think you should have in place. Like one, I do think it's good to think about where is that money gonna go? Because if you are a tenant and contractor and you're making... I have to talk to my media advisor about this, but I think over five hundred dollars per company is when you're issued a ten or nine. Does that sound about right? We are Canadian girls, so oh. <laughs> I get US tax system. But but yes, I I because I was in California for my <laughs> residency and I know that there there's definitely a limit to how much you can get from, you know, collaborations or 
your side hustle income. Before, You're definitely going to have yeah. to start claiming that. Um, but yeah, I don't know I, the the limit. And I think that at one point I did ask a financial advisor about like, okay, should I start an S corp for this social media stuff? I think it was mm-hmm. like when I was in optometry school and their advice when I was, when I was getting like a little over 2k a year, then maybe like consider that. Um, mm-hmm. And I do think it is actually per vendor. So so I think, but everything still goes through my escort. That's, that part's not as important, but thinking about one, like, where's that money going to go? If you are having a ton of income, like don't lose sight of that little project that you did. You do need to report it. Yeah. Um, but two, also to help yourself in negotiation, I do issue contracts to my vendors. So it'll say like, you're purchasing like one reel, you're purchasing distribution. The mm-hmm. total is 1000 and we both sign it and it goes on there. Um, so I try and make it as professional as possible. Uh, even though, you know, in the beginning we were like, what are, should we, what should we do with this? Like we, you know, we did many, many projects and got paid many times where we didn't end up having any contract in place, yeah. just cross yeah. our fingers and hope that they were going to pay us. You yeah. know, now we have like a stipulation <laughs> on things. Like there are things that are really important to me. One, I don't want content circulating and being distributed wherever for yeah. whenever so there are terms and limitations on some of the contracts that i have of you know if you're going to redistribute it's another 500 dollars to put it anywhere else on the platform mm-hmm. uh, outside of instagram um other things that i realized were, were really important is you know making sure that i own my own content making sure that they don't you know just stamp their 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 name on it and again are able to use it however and whenever um, but those things ended up being really important, being paid ahead of time. I know I've had vendors yeah. come back and yeah. they'd say, Definitely. we don't usually do this. We don't usually, um, you know, pay ahead of time. And I said, I completely understand, you know, I'm a full-time eye doctor. I just don't, it, it's really stressful to, to, you know, track this down in good faith. Like we appreciate people paying as close to the time that product is is distributed as possible. And, we, and I hope you can respect that. And I think when you come from that perspective, like, like you're saying, like, we're not full-time editors. We're not full-time, but we still want to put good content out. So, yeah. so hopefully the vendors do like understand that when, when we're working. Yeah. Or even half and half payments would be a great, uh, you know, um, way to meet them down the middle, you know, have them pay half of your compensation before the content's out. And then the other half, of course, maybe after they've received statistics or, you know, after they've ensured that your content actually did fill the requirements of what they wanted you to do. Um, those are awesome tips, Emily. Yeah. I like, honestly, um, half the things that you've mentioned are things that I know deep on and I personally behind the scenes, we are starting to implement and we're starting to learn, um, for anyone out there, like you, um, like Dr. Seitz just mentioned, you know, to make it look more professional, she does have her own contracts there are so many templates out there for social media collaboration contracts. And, you know, I was even discovering those and being like, yeah, four eyes needs a contract. Like we, we <laughs> need this kind of paperwork and documentation. Um, so there's a lot of resources out there for you to just, just start and make yourself look professional from day one and everyone will take you seriously. Yeah. In the beginning, right. I had what was called like a media kit. And it's basically, yes. your, think about it as like your resume for social media. It mm-hmm. shows like the companies you've worked with, the projects that you've been on, the um, engagement that you have, how many followers you have. It's mm-hmm. like, think about it as as your, a resource for that. But it, that's a good, that's a good tool. Well. There are templates on that too. Yeah. And our podcast has a media kit. That's what we've started with. So I think those are great tips because we really, um, kind of just learn all of that on the fly. So I think all your information is going to help so many people. We're going to be seeing so many ad posts on our Instagram after this episode. Everyone's going to be just sponsoring it up now. That's that's how we all get paid, guys. We all get paid by getting paid together. Yeah, um, it's we true. Do. That's how that's how it works. You know, every time we advocate for ourselves, we're advocating for the next person. And that's that's why I think negotiation is so important. That's why we we all want to do it. That's why I do it, is because yeah. I want the next person to get paid um as well. So yeah. And then Emily, since we're coming to the end here, any final thoughts or a motivational message you'd like to share to everyone listening about negotiations? Yeah. I mean, I think it's nerve wracking, especially feeling like you're in a position where you don't have a ton of power, but just know you do have so much more power than you do. Um, 
I mean, I did a poll on my stories a couple summers ago and I was just asking like, Hey, what percentage of you guys actually ended up negotiating? And it was like 40% of people that voted. It was so minimal. So, you know, most of us are not negotiating. And I think when you don't negotiate, it also, you know, went to show that a lot of people regretted negotiating, not, not negotiating when they did not. Um, So don't let that be something that, that holds you back. At least try it try it and see where your comfort level is with it. I know everyone's not going to feel totally comfort comfortable, but remember like negotiating is just the very beginning to open an honest conversation. And it is a natural process of any business interaction. Mm-hmm. That is, that is not atypical for you to ask for things. It's not, um, you know, irregular for you to ask for things that you feel like are important to you and work. It's how you're expressing Hey, this is how I want to work. And this is what I would make me really happy at the job. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a a great introduction and it should be an easy process. It should at the very least, if it's not easy, you know, end up with a a good, having you in a good spot for things that you actually want to get out of your own career. So do it. Yeah. And um, at least for, you know, our women audience, you know, know that we, when we do negotiate, we are good negotiators. So just go for it. Yeah. We're good at everything else. So we need to be good (laughs) at negotiating. (laughs) And then Emily, where can one connect with you if any of our listeners want to ask more questions or talk to you personally about um, negotiating deals? Yeah. So first off, I'm on LinkedIn. We should all connect on LinkedIn. I think that that's kind of going to be the next um, wave of social media and collaboration and professionalism. Um, So I'm on LinkedIn by my name, Emily Seitz. I am on social media by my handle, iSeitz, E-Y-E-S-E-I-T-Z. Um, and you can email me, E-Y-E-S-E-I-T-Z, iSites at gmail.com as well. Thanks everyone for listening to Four Eyes, the podcast series brought to you by Young OD Connect. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and follow us on Instagram or YouTube at Four Eyes Optom for more content. You can also give us a rating and share your thoughts on this episode and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.